So here's where we ended up at the corner of Southeast 99th and Holgate. We talk about a city in crisis. This is the epitome of that. We found everything here from speeding here on Holgate that killed a woman recently to high crime to homeless camps right next to a school. And I met one couple says they're thinking about getting the heck out of here. Cindy Highslope and Randy Lucas have lived in their Lentz neighborhood home for five and a half years, but their breaking point is within reach. I have a lot of concerns around the neighborhood. Cindy still has raw emotions after a friend was killed recently while walking her two dogs on Holgate. Cindy says she watched it happen and that the driver who started the chain reaction crash was speeding. But she's also angry about the theft that she says never ends. We, we can't put out Christmas decorations, Halloween decorations that get stolen out, out of our yard. And we can't call the police because that's a, a minor crime. But we also can't like improve the neighborhood for the children and uh, you know just for our own enjoyment because things get stolen. We have to have our lawn chairs. Um, they're in concrete up to, <laughs> to our, the front of our house or they would be stolen. Both she and Randy feel the law enforcement support is not there, making what they're going through even more difficult. The uh, police, you know, are very slow to respond, and then when they do respond, they give us a lot of attitude, and um, it takes forever to get through on a call, you know, sometimes 20, 30, 40 minutes waiting on non-emergency calls, just sitting on hold. Melissa Wright is improving her backyard, but she knows it's the neighborhood that requires some heavy lifting. From the speeding on nearby Holgate to a homeless camp near Lent Elementary just a few blocks away. Does it affect your livability being here? What's going on down the street? Yes, I mean, it, it brings, I mean, we're not against the transients. We, ha we have a fridge right here that we all, the neighborhood uses and the, the transients utilize it. And I think that's great but they're camping right at the school. And that can be good for the kids. We did find a homeless camp just down the street from the school and a tent directly behind the playground. And all of this has Cindy Highslope and Randy Lucas thinking of moving out. They've always loved Portland, but just can't take it anymore. The crime, the speeding, the lack of police support. It's frustrating, discouraging, and downright sad. It's not really uh, in my realm of, uh, I don't know, expertise <laughs> uh, to know what to do about it. I just know everything they've tried so far is definitely not working. And that's what we found at the corner of Southeast 99th and Holgate. We do have a couple of big updates to the story to tell you about tonight. First of all, we reached out to the Portland Police Bureau to ask about response times to this part of the city. You heard neighbors say they feel like they're getting very little support from law enforcement. They feel left out. Police Chief Chuck Lavelle sat down with K2 and said this. If you have a life emergency, like, uh, you know, someone's attacking you, you're being robbed or you know, there's priority ones and twos. They're the high priority. Someone's here doing something to me. I need help immediately. Um, and those are kind of considered life safety calls, and we go to those first and foremost. And then there are other priority calls that, you know, if someone's available, we'll send someone to. But if they're not, and we're on priority ones and twos, those might stack and wait. That was the chief talking about priorities and why you might wait a while for police. And we have another update for you now. Remember that homeless tent right behind the Lent School playground? We reached out to the mayor's office wondering why it had not been removed. Well, guess what? It has. In fact, just two days ago, they say they removed the tent. And sure enough, we sent a crew out today. It has been cleared. The fact is, I think it's harder to uh, to get a fishing license um, than it is to become a landlord um, in many ways in the state. The number of evictions filed in Oregon courts are spiking, but who's filing them? K2's Christina Giardinelli looked into this and asked the lawmakers how they plan to keep track of Oregon's landlords. And Christina, how are we tracking evictions in the state of Oregon now? Well, you know, the answer to that question is simple. We're not keeping track. The only way to get a record of the evictions in Oregon are to look at the ones that are filed in court. And studies show that's only a small percentage of what's actually happening, of the displacements actually happening. What's more, we know very little about the property owners that are behind these evictions. 
The homeless crisis in Oregon is on the lips of all Oregon candidates vying for our votes this November. But why are so many people sleeping on the streets? Advocates say evictions play a part. Shelby Brooks is a Marion County tenant education specialist. Really, all renters are one, one bad landlord or one freak accident away from being out on the streets in a tent. With pandemic tenant protections now expired, those displacements are increasing. The Oregon Law Center has been tracking court filed evictions during the pandemic. It found they increased by 119 percent from 2020 to 2021. But Sybil Hep, the center's policy director, says that's just the tip of the iceberg. For every court filing of eviction, there are approximately two to five informal evictions or non-court related displacements um, that happen. And What's more, we know very little about the property owners behind those evictions. And are these local landlords or are these multi-state or multinational corporations? We, we don't have a way to track that. I asked two Oregon lawmakers, both on housing committees, if they will change that. Los Angeles County actually did put in a landlord registry uh, to, to track some of those things that we talked about. Is this something that you'll look at? Representative Maxine Dexter. It's definitely something being considered. Um, how that's implemented or who would be included is absolutely a topic of discussion. Senator Casey Jama. And as someone who believes data, uh, I do think that it's important to ensure that we, we collect the data. Genevieve, the emergency board recently approved more than a million dollars to address this shortage of training academies. Yeah, right. $1.28 million to add two more police trainings to the calendar. Right now, nearly every new officer has to go through one of these trainings. And the deal is there are just too many new hires and not enough courses. The Portland police just hired 20 new officers in September. This is truly a great day for me and for the Portland Police Bureau. It's the biggest group Chief Chuck Lavelle can remember in recent history. It's a lot of hard work that's going on in the personnel division. But there's a problem. Most of these new hires still need to do their official basic police training. There's only one training academy in the state. It's in Salem, and it's been in high demand. So much so, there isn't an opening for these officers to do this mandatory training until March. That's a five-month wait for something that, under Oregon law, it's supposed to be done within 90 days of hire. This delay is a challenge bureaus across the state are facing. Everybody would like the students in class as soon as possible because it helps with the operational needs of the organizations they've been hired into. And it also means that, that we're getting trained police officers out there on the street faster uh, and than, than if they have to wait. Two weeks ago, the legislature stepped in. The emergency board approved the addition of two more courses this biennium. Each class costs about $640,000. The extra money, allowing 80 more officers to get trained up between now and the end of June.